Hello and welcome to our Christ Baptist Church devotional as we're going through uh, the, the post-exilic uh, books, uh, the books where Israel had gone to Babylon and then what happened after Babylon and they returned back to uh, Jerusalem. They call it post-exilic, meaning it's after the exile, after the 70 years in Babylon. So we've covered uh, the books of Daniel, the book of Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah. And it covers the time frame from, if you take Daniel at about 605 B.C., all the way down to Nehemiah, which is 445 B.C., plus about 12 more years, so 432 B.C., roughly. Uh, so we're, we're, we're talking about 140 years or so, 150 years maybe, uh, in that time frame. So a century and a half of what happened from when they first got captured in, under Daniel, went 70 years, and then Daniel chapter, uh, se- basically chapter 10 tells us 9 and 10 is when they were sent back under the decree of Cyrus, and that was 538 B.C., and then we picked up there into the book of Ezra, which began at that time of the, ty- of the decree of Cyrus, and took us down. And with that also interesting story of the book of Esther that's tucked in there between Ezra and Nehemiah right in there that uh, that tells us right about the time of of 480 BC or so is when Esther was the queen of, of, of Persia and her cousin Mordecai was running the kingdom and so Ezra recounts the time when they began building they stopped they began building again they completed and then went through a time of just not really following the Lord and in very much chaos. And then Ezra returned to uh, Jerusalem. He went there and began to set things in order and teach the law to the people and, and had it going about 13 years before Nehemiah showed up. Nehemiah showed up 445 B.C. And then we begin. So uh, Nehemiah was about to 458 B.C. And then here comes Nehemiah. Seeing again the temple broken down torn apart, but he goes, and and his his being a governor, not a prophet or a king, but a governor, and he got things done. And that took us down to about 430 B.C., toward the end when there's 400 years of silence before Christ comes. And we saw that through the book of Nehemiah, what was happening there. There's one more book we want to go through, even though we, we did go through the prophet Haggai a little bit, just a little bit under the book of Ezra. We took a, a brief stint and went through chapter 1 of Haggai. There's only two chapters in Haggai, so it's a book you can quickly read through. And the book of Haggai is a prophet who was in 520 B.C. He, he came on the scene to just really encourage the people. The Lord says you need to build his temple, and he's with you. you. You don't lose heart, don't lose courage. You need to consider your ways, and don't get comfortable, don't get soft, but let's get busy with the work of the Lord. We saw that in Haggai especially chapter 1, and chapter 2 could carries on. As they began carrying on the work, now the prophet really encouraged them. So it was first to, to kind of get up and get going, and the second was, all right, now that you're going, it's going to be great. And that was the prophet Haggai. During that early stage, right, when they'd come back from Cyrus, they stalled a bit, and then Haggai came in to spur them on to build the temple, which they did. That little temple that, that got sort of smaller than Solomon's temple, but it got built, and then they suffered some type of a malaise, some type of a, uh, they, were, they were complacent and, and, and they lost their way and then Ezra came to get them straightened out. Well, we've seen that now, given that background. We're now going to look at the prophet Malachi. Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament. The very last book. Malachi. And what's Malachi about? Well, the word Malachi, the name Malachi, actually not a word, it's a name, the name of the prophet. Malachi it means my servant, my servant. Uh, the word Malach means servant or angel even, it's used in the Old Testament. And uh, whenever you have the word I or the, the letter I on the end of a word, it usually means mine, it's, it's, it's mine. So my servant, Malachi. And uh, there's just a few chapters, three chapters of Malachi. But we're not going to take it one chapter at a time. We're going to take it one thought at a time of what's going on. Now, Malachi is prophesying 
during the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. During that time, we don't have any specific date. We don't know whether he was toward the end, toward Nehemiah's time, or toward the beginning, early part of Ezra's time, or even before Ezra's time, going closer to the time of, of even Esther. We don't know exactly when this was. But I think as we take a look at the detail of it, we'll begin to see it looks like it's more toward the time of Nehemiah. And, and the, maybe that time between Ezra and Nehemiah it could be either the latter part of Ezra or during Nehemiah's time that Malachi came to prophesy, came to really give God's word to the people. Remember, Nehemiah was not a prophet. He was a governor. And Ezra was not a prophet. He was a scribe. He would be like a Bible teacher. Malachi was one who said, here is the word of the Lord. Very clearly. And we're just going to cover the first five verses here. Uh, the in this devotion here just to to see what's going on here and it kind of makes sense with what's happening with israel with the nation israel having gone back and it's been about 80 years or so and now they're in jerusalem and struggling they got they got trouble from enemies without they, they got rich people within that are causing trouble they've got a lot of this going on and malachi now comes and he's talking to them about their own problems let's read this malachi chapter 1 verse 1 the oracle of the word of the lord to israel through malachi there we have it uh, the prophecy the oracle the burden specifically this is prophetic word from god to israel through malachi verse 2 i have loved you says the lord but you say how have you loved us was not esau jacob's brother declares the lord yet i have loved jacob but I've hated Esau, and I've made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Stop there for a moment. In Malachi, we're going to see in the first couple chapters especially, but it's throughout the book, God makes a statement, and then he also makes an assertion, not so much an accusation, but an assertion. He says, I say this, but you say this. And you ask, you, you say, how does that make sense? So I'm making a statement, and then, then you're turning around and saying, but no, Lord, that's not right. And that's what goes on and on through the book, as Malachi points out issues. Here's the first issue right here. The Lord says here to the people in Jerusalem who are coming back from Cyrus' decree, it's been a while, now they're there during this time of Ezra and Nehemiah, there's there's dis, there's problems there's enemies sometimes and they've had to stop and various things are going on and here's malachi i have loved you says the lord that's the first statement he says i've loved you but you say how have you loved us now if that's their question it means they can't see his love at all because they say how i couldn't even name one way that you seem to be loving us that's really the situation. They're so blind that they can't even name one thing in which they would say, yes, God loves me and I know this. This is completely being unthankful. This is, this is ungrateful. They don't understand the Lord. They cannot see any blessings that he's given. All they see is their problems. He says, but you say, how have you loved us? Well, here's his answer. Let's start with when it went all the way back to the beginning of Israel's history. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. You see, Esau was the elder brother. Jacob was the younger brother. So the older brother is the one that should have gotten the inheritance the one that should have gotten the covenants, the one that everything should have been based on Esau. But it wasn't. It was based on Jacob. He said there were two brothers in the womb. The elder shall serve the younger. He said, I have loved you. I have loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. Does this mean God really had it in for Esau? No, Esau got, grew very rich. Esau was very prosperous. What was Esau's problem? Well, he sold his birthright to beginning. 
at, at the very beginning. And it says in Genesis, he despised his birthright. He despised his first place. He despised the idea that he was carrying the seed of the woman that would eventually produce the Messiah. He despised that. God's plan was to go through the younger brother. Now, when we say, I've hated Esau, there's a, there's a Jewish expression that happens quite often, and, and we see it in Genesis when we see in Jacob's life, he wanted to marry Rachel, but Rachel's father tricked him and gave him Leah instead. Gave him Leah, the, the firstborn, not Rachel. And, and so he tricked him and said, no, you must marry this one first, then you get Rachel. He wanted Rachel so bad. The Bible tells us that Rachel was loved and Leah was hated. Leah was hated. That, that's what the Bible says. Now, was Leah hated? No, she wasn't hated. She was less loved. She was not loved like Rachel. Because Jacob did take her in. He had children through her. And, and she was his wife. And he took care of her. But not like Rachel. See, that's what the word hated means here. It's the same exact word used in the Hebrew language for Leah. The, the first bride of Jacob that he wasn't happy with. But he took her in and he loved her anyway. But he was tricked. He, and he took her in. But he didn't hate her. He just loved Rachel so much more. So we see this is being used by God to say, here's a way to express a way that you love much less. Jesus used the same thing in the Greek language when he came in and he says, I came so that, you know, he says, he who does not hate his mother, father, sister, brother, and will turn and come after me and the gospel is not worthy of me. He doesn't want you to hate your family. It's a matter of where's your allegiance? Where's your true love? Where are you, where are you really going to attach to? Christ or your blood, your family, your people group? So that's what this hated and love means here. He says, I've really put my affections on you, not Esau, and he was the firstborn. Not that I hate him. And he says, verse 3, but I've hated Esau and I've made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jaggers of the wilderness. He's down there in the south. He doesn't have what you have, the land of Canaan. You see, the first place that God says I've loved you is look at the land you're living in. Now, these are people back in Jerusalem, so they're in their own land. You don't have Esau's desolate de desert territory. Look what you've got. You can plant vineyards. You can plant fields. You've got rain. I loved you. Look what you have. These are people who don't even remember. They were in 70 years captivity because they didn't just disobey God. They tried to use their disobedience to God to profit themselves even more. They, they didn't farm the, they farmed the land every seventh year when they're supposed to let it lie fallow, lie barren. But they farmed anyway, said, hey, we can get even more. God will give us three times the crops in the sixth year, and then we'll farm the seventh year, we'll get that too. And they did that for so many times. Actually, 70 times we, sat, we, see, we saw that in the book of Daniel. So these are people who, who use their disobedience to try to say, oh, and I can get a little more out that God didn't give me. That's how they think. So they're not even thinking God gave us this land. We had 70 years captivity and he faithfully brought us out and here we are back in our own land. Are we so thankful? No, they're not. No, they're not. So he says, just point to Esau. They don't even have this land. You do. Verse four, though Edom says, we've been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hopes. They may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. You see, Edom is very proud. They, in the time of the Babylonians coming, the people tried to escape. The times the Assyrians came, the people tried to escape, 
And who was there to capture them and take them as slaves but Edom? Edom would take them as slaves, sell them off, work them, keep them away from their families. Yes, even Israel resorted to slavery, and the people in Israel resorted to slavery. Edom, the brother of Jacob, took his own people to, to take him as slaves and sell him as slaves. And so Edom is very proud. They've been against Israel. And he says, you're going to say, we've been beaten down, but you know what? We, on our own strength, on our own might, because we're mighty people, we're going to build up and we're going to have a great kingdom. But, but God says, you might say that, but watch what I do. I'll tear it down. Why? Because I don't love you like I love Jacob. I'm not going to let you build up on your own. I will do that. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. You see, if he hasn't chosen you, if he hasn't put his love on you, if you're not in Christ, he's indignant with you forever. That's a promise. If, if you're not in Christ, now this is Old Testament Israel. We know that. If you're not in God's chosen people, you're not in there with that. He's indignant with you, not for a while, forever. And he gives them a promise in verse 5. Your eyes will see this and will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. You'll see. Right now you cannot see your blessings. You will see how the Lord, I, will be magnified outside of Israel everywhere. You'll see it in my judgment. You'll see it raising people up. You'll see this. And I've actually chosen you. And you've been taken out of captivity because of my promise. And here you are. And you can't think of one way that I've loved you. You can't think of one thing I've done in defeating your enemies. One thing I've done in raising up kings like David, Jehoshaphat. I've, I've given you kings. I've given you prophets continually. If you would just heed my word, you would have you would have decades and centuries of blessing. But you want to steal from me thinking that I'm not good, thinking that I'm not good enough. And I say steal, I mean, you, I give you something and you think how you can twist it to get something I didn't plan for you to have. See, God wanted them not to farm every seventh year so they would learn to depend on him and he would bountifully give to them. But they said, I don't want to trust you. I don't want to depend on you. I want to show you I can do it on my own. This is the first thing he starts with. He doesn't start with the problems of their sins and all they're doing. We're going to see that as we get the rest of chapter 1. All kinds of sins that are named that we've discovered when we read Nehemiah. But he starts with the very basic premise. You know why you've got all these other sins? You know why you're having problems with offerings and why you're having problems with divorce and why you're having problems with, with all kinds of sins that are going on out there is because you don't think I'm good. I tell you I've loved you, and you say, how? That is, I think, the first and foremost sin that once we agree with and once we believe that, we're now open to every other kind of sin there is, which is, how have you loved me, Lord? How have you blessed me? How have you cared for me? How have you done that? I can't think of one thing that you've done. This is the chief of all sins. God is not good. Why? We found it in Genesis chapter 3, don't we? Did God really say you can't eat from every tree in the garden? God is not good. We know he's sovereign because we see what happens in nature. We see what happens in events, the wind and everything happens and all kinds of un, un, unpredictable things happen. We say, oh, that's God and he's in control of everything. Yes, I know, but is he good? See, his people would say he's good. Those who are not his people say what? In Revelation, the rocks and the hills fall on us so that we don't have to face the wrath of the Lamb. We don't want to face God. The whole book of Revelation is about people who actually have God speaking to them through angels and through all these revelatory means. And he comes at them with the gospel more and more and more. And you know what they say is, get away from me. That's an amazing event. 
It starts with one small disobedience of God is not good in the garden, and it ends with the entire earth saying, God, would you please leave? We were doing fine until you got here. The whole book is filled with all the people that do that. Where does it come from? Right here in Malachi. As he's talking to his people, I've loved you. How have you loved us? You haven't loved us. I can't think of one thing. Do you ever find yourself in this situation where all you can think of is God must be doing something to you and he's never done something for you? Do you think about that? Those are very dangerous thoughts. You need to start thinking about count your many blessings, count them one by one. Detail those blessings. What you don't have, you don't need. And if you do have need, you ask of God, and he will care for you. He is your father. You might get it in ways you don't expect or even comprehend. But our attitude is he loves us. He has demonstrated that. And we're only here for a time until our time is up, and then he calls our soul back to himself as a loving father. While we're here, we draw breath. We can serve him. We can delight in him because we know as as we walk in obedience his love flows through us and he sustains us and keeps us going because we're not attaching to the achievements and the idols of the world we want him i've loved you how have you loved us that's the first step the first lie the first step on the path of denying everything about god how have you loved Don't find yourself getting upset at God as circumstances happen. Use those as moments to draw near to God and say, God, I need you now more than ever because I'm seeing that I cannot control this situation. I actually can't make an outcome out of this situation. That's okay. You can. I now depend on you because I know you've loved me. And you'll find the right solution. I know that. That's what we see here in the first five verses of Malachi my messenger speaking to the people right in the time of ezra and nehemiah where we've seen ezra the priest the bible teacher nehemiah the governor keeping things in line and now malachi the prophet saying thus saith the lord and this is what the people needed to hear to help them as they were able to populate jerusalem so this is malachi chapter one we'll now get to the second part of chapter one here in the next devotion see you then